Uh, so very welcome, very warm welcome to our session today on introducing you to the taught postgraduate programs uh, at, at SOAS. Uh, we are very happy that you're joining us. And perhaps we start briefly. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you brief introductions to ourselves and, and Kanika is going to start and then I follow. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the research culture and directions of the source law school to give you a bit of an idea of who we are and to also impress on you that our teaching program is very much research led so what we do in our research is reflected in our teaching and then we're going to tell you a little bit about the structures of our the structure of our PhD, uh, of our MA and LM programs, and then allow you to ask questions. Uh, and we have a PowerPoint, but we thought it's nice to actually start our uh, to 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 start us off with actually just being able to see each other. So I'm going to hand over to Kanika, please. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, uh, Kim, while we, uh, Martin and I are talking, if you could give us co-host privileges, please, so that we can share our PowerPoint when it's time to do that. Um, so I'm Dr. Kanika Sharma. I am at the law school at SOAS. We are now the School of Law, uh, Gender and Media. And um, my own research is on... Um, Thank you, Kim. My own research is on a colonial legal history of South Asia, where I'm particularly interested in the development of women's rights and transnational feminist movements in the late uh, 19th century. But I also look at the way in which um, images, architecture, and theater are used in political trials in the Indian subcontinent. And towards this end, I'm working with the theater director at the moment to stage a commission of inquiry into the political trial, or I argue, the political trial of um, the last Mughal emperor by the East India Company in 1858. So that's a little bit about my research. As we're going to um, talk to you through this session today, we'll also talk to you about how um, how, as Martin mentioned, our, our teaching is research-led, so we like to bring in our research uh, into our modules as well. Over to you, Martin. I tried to multitask and also write a quick text uh, to, to uh, one of our, to Labiba Roxana. Uh, so, so I'm going to do this and then I'm going to turn back to our session. You can see what I've just written. <laughs> in the in the chat yes no thank you very much Kanika so the Kanika and I actually share a research and a teaching interest because we both have an interest in in South Asian law and we co-convene uh, yeah one of our I think flagship modules at the School of Law it's a it's a module course called, uh, called Law and Society in South Asia and for next year, actually, this particular module is going to change and made more postgraduate specific with a particular dedicated postgraduate MA and LLM stream for this module. Currently, it's still being co-taught with third year undergraduates. My own research interest, well, I've been at SOAS for quite some time. So, so, so I think I still retain a strong interest in South Asia. But from working very much on the role and impact of Islam on the legal systems of South Asia, I've also branched out a bit into environmental law and more recently also in dispute resolution, arbitration, mediation, again with a reference to, 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 South, to, to South Asia. I'm so sorry, I've got this Siri thing which kind of goes on in the background. I need to disable this somehow. And uh, yes, uh, I think both Kanek and my research actually flows directly into law and society in South Asia. And in my case, my environmental law interest also leads me to co-convene with Professor Philippe Coulet, a, a course on law, social justice and the environment which is a compulsory half module for anyone doing a specialism in 
in environmental law, either at MA or the LLM specialisms. Uh, yeah, I think this is, a, we both, I mean, of course, publish. I also co-edit the yearbook of, actually, I'm the editor-in-chief of the yearbook of Islamic and Middle Eastern law. And you will see when you visit the School of Law website that one kind of hallmark of our law school is a strong kind of publication culture. So we, we publish from the School of Law a, a number of, of journals, including the Journal of African Law, the uh, Journal of uh, Law, Environment and, and Development, the Journal of Comparative Law, and our postgraduate students also actually uh, publish the source. Is it coming as a good, the source law journal? Uh, the source law journal, yes. Uh, uh, and, you know, each year actually there's a call for students to participate in various functions uh, in that journal. We also have, and then I kind of uh, hand over to talk a bit more about our, the content of the, our research, but uh, in terms of structure and outlets, we have a number of research centers. In fact, Kanaka is the director of our center for Asian, Asian law. But yeah, I won't kind of bore you with the long list of all these centers. But uh, if you visit our website, you'll see that we have uh, four or five research centers specific on particular regions or or areas of law. And again, kind of welcome students to become member of these centers during their studies at, at source. And all these centers have kind of various uh, activities, mainly in the form of, of conferences and, and lecture series. And Kanika, in fact, I think also prepared a few wonderful slides about our research directions and what really informs what principles, ideas and values inform our research. And I just hand you back to, to Kanika now, please. Uh, thank you, Martin. So I'm going to quickly um, share our screen if I can see where to, huh? Um, Kim, it seems you might have to give me host privileges to be able to share screen at the moment, please. Kanika, I can do it as well. I, I practiced well, if, it beforehand. Uh, okay, he just did, so I can. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. Because I can't. If you have difficulties, I can do it for you. If so, you so want to do that, Martin, because for some reason I can't see the option to be able to share PowerPoint. Um, I just hope it's the, the right slide, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> Bear with us. Oh, thanks, Martin. I can see that. That's perfect. Is it is it all right? Uh, yeah, if you would just, if you want to do a slideshow. Uh, give me a second. Slideshow. Got it. Wow. Okay. Uh, this is looks. We've done that already, and Martin, you'll have to go through the slides because you'll have control over yeah. them. Yeah. So, so here I'm going to keep my microphone on as well, so that you can give me. So, so here we just have the presenters, dear audience. So this is Kanika and my email addresses, but you also find this again on the SOAS website. Do you want me to go on? Yes, please. Okay, so um, if you're looking to do your uh, postgraduate degree at SOAS uh, in law, you've got a choice of two, uh, two streams, really two programs. You can either to choose to do the LLM stream, and that's for those who have a, a prior degree in law, but we also offer an MA stream, MA in law stream, and that's for those who uh, perhaps are interested in law, but don't actually have a prior degree in law. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. Now, uh, the speciality of SOAS, is, uh, we were set up in, uh, I want to say 1916, and we were set up to look at particularly uh, Asian and African legal systems. And that is something that we continue to do so today. So our speciality is a unique focus on the legal systems 
social legal challenges and jurisprudence that is emerging out of Asia and Africa. So, and as Martin and I both uh, said at the start, we're, um, we're both uh, South Asia specialists. If we go, could go back, please, Martin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, so you, uh, the options in front of you as you uh, choose to join SOAS would be you either choose to do an LLM, again, depending on whether you have a previous law degree or not, or you choose to do an MA. Once you've chosen those sort of broad streams, you've got choices and programs within them. And we're going to come back to that in a second. While you're choosing those, you could, of course, also choose modules outside the law school. So you could choose uh, modules from languages, culture, arts, humanities, politics, economics, entirely up to you. So you've got the choice. Uh, for some streams, you will have to choose at least one core law module. Um, or two, de uh, depending on what degree you want, but there is flexibility for you to create a program that best suits your needs from take, picking and choosing from across different schools. Can I, can I just add to this, Kanika? Of course. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. So, so I think this is a point well made and I think perhaps makes us stand out also in terms of MA and LM programs. So you can do a total of 30 credits outside the School of Law uh, in another kind of postgraduate model. For, for some modules, we suggest that you actually liaise with the program conveners of the MA and LLM just to see that it's suitable. I mean, in years past, for instance, students were interested and still are in, for instance, studying Arabic language, but sometimes underestimate the real workload associated with actually doing 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 another language but otherwise we always encourage our students to you know branch out and take advantage of of this yeah amazing kind of learning environment and range of uh, courses offered also in in other departments of, of source thanks Kaneka. thanks martin if we could go to the next slide please yeah Right. So in our degree programs, we're particularly interested in sort of broad themes that all of us across uh, the law school work on in one way or the other. We're particularly concerned with studying law as a form of power that can be used to either marginalize people as to oppress people, but we're equally interested in looking at how can the people themselves use law to overturn oppressive structures. So how can law empower individuals? So law as a repressive, oppressive tool on the one hand, but equally law as something that can empower the population on the other. And this is particularly relevant to Asia and Africa uh, today because we see this in the everyday lives and interactions of people with law in these regions. We're also interested in issues of intersectionality and intersectionality simply is um, the idea that as human beings we are different identities intersect with each other. So my identity as a woman intersects as a, with my identity um, as a brown person, as someone of South Asian heritage and ethnicity, and all of those identities intersect. And we look at the way in which law uh, relates to other structuring forces, other structural ideas, including race, gender, sexuality, and class. And this is something that comes up uh, repeatedly, no matter what you might be studying. You might be studying environment, but we will also still be looking at the impact of environmental law uh, on issues of race and gender. And at the heart of all of our work is the question of decolonization. Um, and I know that decolonization is a buzzword these days, but I'd like to think that SOAS sort of was on that bandwagon long before many of the other universities have jumped on it. And the question of decolonization is, uh, I mean, it's a big word, but the question is really simple. The question is, given that law was central to the colonial project, and given the fact that post-colonial state systems are based on the colonial legacy, how can we think about decolonizing law? How can we think about in Asia and Africa, moving away from the European influence, moving away from the Western influence and the imperialism and colonialism that that first interaction was wrapped up in? 
Mr. Martin. Yeah, no, thank you. I just wanted to, I mean, I, whenever I kind of write on South Asian law, it's always kind of an almost kind of surreal sensation when you write the years of the legislation which is still kind of being used and current in in south asia so we have the contract act of 1872 the indian and pakistan penal code both from 1860 so you know you you just you can't get away from this kind of colonial heritage so the next slide please kanika and, and <laughs> let me know if you want me to take over but i think you're doing it's so so very nicely <laughs> I, i'll do to the end of this one and then you can take over okay uh so these are our degree programs um as i said we've got two broad streams you can either do the llm stream if you've got a previous degree in law or you can do the ma stream uh by and large the two streams overlap so for instance you could do an llm in environmental law and sustainable development equally you could do an in ma in environment law and sustainable development similarly you could do human L L llm or an ma in human rights conflict and justice you could do uh the, the dual degree in international law or in islamic law we do have some specific LLM only streams, and these are an LLM in international commercial and economic law, and an LLM in law and gender, and an LLM in law development and globalization. So by and large, there is flexibility for you to be able to choose the, the program that you want, uh, and the same stuff is available as both as an LLM and an MA. Some, however, are restricted in entry to those who have previous law degrees because they are LLM only programs. You might be in a position where when you're entering the law school, um, you do not actually know yet what you would like to do. And for that, or you might actually have very broad interests and you might find these streams restrictive. If you're in that position, we also have general streams. So you could just do an LLM in law and you can just do an MA in legal studies. These are general programs that don't require you to choose um, specific modules. Now, uh, I, as part of my work at SOAS, also am the MA in law um, program convener. It is the MA program is something that I'm very strong, I very strongly believe in. And the reason that I do that is because I myself don't have an undergraduate law background. I actually don't even have an MA <laughs> law background. So I'm someone who did an undergraduate in journalism, did a master's in politics, and then moved to a PhD in law. And I think this is one of the beauties of the programs that it doesn't require you to have decided at the age of 17 that you wanted to do law and stick to law throughout. You may have changed your mind midway. You may, you may now want to do law and the MA in law program um, is happy for you to join us. And I think actually we, we need to think about this in a broader way. No matter what degree you have previously, whether you have a degree in economics or politics or sociology, those you bring that knowledge with you to law. And part of the SOAS sort of remit is really to have to look at the social legal simple, rather than the simply legal. So we welcome this interdisciplinary background. It's something that will hold you in good stead at SOAS. Um, Martin? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, 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 do you want to continue, Kanika, or do you, what do you want? You could, you could, Martin. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm just going to, to continue with the theme of what Kanika just said, namely that, in fact, a, a number of our colleagues actually don't have a kind of classic law background. Uh, and in fact, you know, because <laughs> the way we ended up in the law school already kind of gives you a hint that we actually didn't want to become kind of solicitors in, in magic circle law firms, but we were interested in in studying and researching law and very much law in the source approach, if I may call it that, which as Kanika uh, explained, really kind of draws from, from a number of disciplines. And in some ways, in some areas, perhaps law is uh, 
as a black letter law narrowly defined is the least important part of what we actually do uh, in the in the school of of law uh, uh, kanika already hinted at the kind of history of source which really kind of started up very much as part of the colonizing project uh, source was founded to train civil servants for uh, dispatch and deployment in the British Empire's colonies. But oddly enough, I think this particular heritage also kind of allows us now uh, to, to critically engage with that history and also take advantage of what is an extraordinary collection of, of materials, including legal materials on, on South Asia. So we, we have, we are the a, a reference library on, on South Asian law. And you will see that the same applies uh, in terms of our collections with, with other uh, regions uh, of the world. Uh, talking about resources, uh, uh, we, we are incredibly well placed uh, in, in, in London. So we are right next to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, which has one of the if not the largest kind of law libraries in, in Western Europe. You're also able to use the library in Senate House, University of London. And in fact, the law school is now uh, housed uh, in this very nice uh, 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 architectural kind of gem in, in Central London, uh, uh, the University of London, which actually inspired uh, the 1984 the the depiction of the of the ministry of truth uh, and truth is of course all we are we are all about uh, so and let me just go to the next slide uh, yes so, so we've already talked about about our our research culture and research-led teaching what i might do with you very briefly is to actually go very very quickly back to our structure here our degree programs because i don't wanted to just tell you a little bit about uh, the academic year because we still have a few few hours left so when you started so as, as an ma student you you attend a two-week prior pre-sessional uh, course which will give you inductions into various areas of law and will enable you to actually uh, follow and, and grasp the law specific content of the modules you're going to study. And in fact, this year, Kanika was the program convener for, for this pre-sessional module. You then have to take uh, if I could, sorry, if I yes, could just please, please. Yes, yes. Phone, sorry, I, I completely meant I forgot about the pre-sessional. So it, just to quickly tell you about the pre-sessional, if you're an MA in law student, uh, the pre-sessional fee is part of your fees already, so you don't have to pay extra. It's a two week uh, session that we do just before the start of term. So it's usually in mid September for two weeks. Um, and it is a session that uh, very quickly in two weeks, it's an intensive session that introduces you to legal terminology and ideas. So uh, because some of you might be feeling apprehensive about doing an MA in law without a law background. And this is really just to put your mind at ease. It is also something that uh, LLM students can choose to you, you do uh, and you pay a bit extra but you can do it and it's really popular for students such as Lu Lucia right now who asked well I've got a civil law background w will I be able to do an LLM we often encourage you to do the pre-sessional because it gives you a quick training into common law over two extensive weeks so um so for those of you who are a little bit apprehensive about are you the right fit for this program like you are interested in it but you may not have the vocabulary to be able to go into the modules i highly recommend the pre-sessional for that reason Martin. yeah brilliant thank you thank you kanika you know i'm glad we, we covered that so 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 you join us either at the middle of september or towards the end of september for enrollment uh, you will then be given source email address of course and uh, access to our 
a kind of Moodle Blackboard learning environment, and you'll find that this is going to be your main resource for module specific readings and information. So each module has a Blackboard uh, site with discussion boards and so on. Uh, you need to take in order to, to get your degree, you need to accumulate a total of 120 credits of taught modules. Uh, at the law school, we have either full modules, which stretch across both the first and the second term, and we have half modules, which are taught only in one term. So in theory, you could also take eight half modules in order to actually get up to your 120 credits. In terms of assessment, all these modules have different types of assessment. And if you go later on into our source uh, website, law school website, and you enter the module specific information, you will see at the bottom the assessment. You will see that most of our modules are not any longer taught exclusively or, in fact, at all by, by written exams. And we, yes, certainly Kanek and I always kind of debate, you know, new forms of. of a useful assessment, which is fun and, and uh, gives you an opportunity to research and, and be creative. So uh, we, we try to, to do this and you'll see the same in, in, in other modules. The most of our, uh, well, all postgraduate modules really are seminar style. So you're expected to do advanced reading. Each module normally has two hours of, of tuition or meeting time per, per week. And uh, you would be expected to really do reading in advance. So, so if you're used to a, a university culture, which is more lecture based, where you go into a lecture theater and just take notes, you would have to kind of readjust a little bit because we, we really want students to participate in discussions and exchange views and, and really learn and develop through, through that particular form of, of interaction. You have the option of doing a general master's with no kind of specialization mentioned on your degree certificate. The same is correct for the MA in legal studies. And then you'll see the list of different specialisms. If you take one of these specialisms, again, you can check our website. There are then a particular portfolio of modules you need to take in order to qualify. Once you've done your taught course, you're going to go into the kind of Easter vacation. If your modules have written exams, you would then sit these exams between kind of May and June. And then comes a really exciting part. We then have uh, a MA LLM dissertation colloquium, which is a one day event where students present their ideas and initial work on their dissertations. That work would have started in the beginning of January when you would be looking for supervisors and be allocated a supervisor for your dissertation. And in the summer, then you are expected to, to work on your dissertation. That is a now 10,000 words, Kanika, is it? It is now 10,000. It's 10, 12,000 12, words. Apologies, 12. It's some of these word limits that I kind of should be. So it's now for both MA and LLM students, 12,000 words dissertation. You hand this in at the, on the 15th of September. And uh, yeah, then this really, in terms of from your own perspective, completes your, your degree if you do it full time. Or, of course, you can stretch it across uh, three academic years if you're doing it part time. And then you'll be the part holder of either an MA and LLM certificate. And yeah, this is our program structure. And the next slide and the need fast forward is then going to talk about what can you do with a source MA or LLM degree in terms of careers. Kanika, do you want to take over? I, from I'll me? just come in uh, for a second here as well. And just Please, give, yes. Uh, I'll let you know that the dissertation is a very key component of both the LLM and the MA program. As Martin said, most of our modules are 30 or 15 credit modules. Uh, the dissertation module is actually worth 160 credits. So it is 
uh, it's out of a, it's a third of your total more uh, credit count. You have to take a total of 180 to achieve in either an MA or a LLM. So it's quite central to your final mark. And it is something that we encourage you to start thinking about as early as possible. So for instance, uh, as MA program convener, it's only last week that we had our first dissertation workshop. So this is not something that we just say, right, go away in summer, do your dissertation. It's something that mm -hmm. we work with you throughout to help you have the ability to write a dissertation, to think about what you want to work on and look at the best ways in which the law school can support you in doing a dissertation to the best of your abilities. So um, don't worry about it. It looks like, oh, we're gonna go over in the summer and write it, but you'll be supported uh, with the process throughout. Yeah, no, thank you, Kanika. I think that is a really uh, uh, important point you're making. Uh, so the dissertation, work on the dissertation really is in a sense your fifth module in the first and, and second term. And in fact, formal uh, supervision will stop in the summer. You know, you, you have kind of emergency access to a specified member of staff, but your supervisor uh, themselves will actually have stopped the formal uh, supervision once it comes to the summer. And I just see there is a, a Adintunji uh, Omolu, who asked very quickly about the PhD program. And let me just address this before we go into career. So there are two additional postgraduate programs we offer. And the first one, and we didn't mention it on the slide, is called the Masters in Research, the M Res in Law. This is in structure, not dissimilar to the MA or LLM, but has a a, a more focused component on research uh, skills and the dissertation is significantly longer than for the MA and the LLM. And this MRES in law, we have envisaged and introduced as a kind of stepping stone towards doing a PhD. So if you want to do a PhD, but you somehow feel or we feel that you're not quite ready for being plunged into the a deep end of, of a PhD research, we would very much encourage you to do the MRES in law and use this as a stepping stone to actually go into the PhD program. For admission to the PhD program, of course, you need an excellent PhD proposal. You need a, a postgraduate degree. It doesn't have to be law. As, as Kanika explained, but of course we would kind of pay attention on the quality of your research proposal and within your previous kind of academic work, we would pay particular attention on your writing skills and the marks, for instance, you achieved in an MA or LLM uh, dissertation. And uh, yeah, so, so, so I think the one thing I would like to impress on you, those interested in PhD, is to take the MRES in law quite seriously because it's an excellent way of easing yourself into the PhD and to ensure that you complete the PhD on time. So we've got, it's 17 minutes to, uh, to 11 London time. And I know that both Kanik and I actually will have to leave before the hour finishes because Kanika has teaching and and I have a, a, a meeting which I can't shift. So Kanika, shall we go to careers or is there anything else on the program? No careers is fine. Careers. Perfect. Uh, I just fast forward to to the slide. So while Martin's doing that, just to uh, make clear why we didn't touch on the PhD here, we'd look at our postgraduate programs in two ways broadly. One's the taught postgraduate, and that's what we're discussing today. And the other one's a postgraduate research and the MRES and the PhD fall within uh, the PGR stream. And we're today only discussing the PGT stream. But if you want to have a broader conversation about the PGR stream, you've got our email IDs, feel free to email us and Martin and I can respond to queries there as well. Uh, but just to, so you know, it's right now in November that uh, so as PhD applications open up, so if you, you're thinking about your proposal, do get in touch with uh, whoever, have a look at the staff uh, profile, see who you'd like to potentially work with and get in touch with them to see uh, whether you're at a place right now to already submit an application or not. 
Right. Uh, so once you've finished, uh, Martin very uh, nicely brought us to uh, the summer period where you're writing your dissertation and you submit in September, and then you're ready to return to the world with a new law degree. And a lot of careers are open to you. These are some of the careers that our past students have done. Uh, Often people end up working with non-governmental organizations, think tanks, governance and policy institutes. Um, the, one of the key advantages that SOAS of course offers is an in-depth knowledge of legal systems of Asia and Africa. And of course, many of the people who study law in UK don't have the same advantage. So this is what sets you apart from others. And increasingly, as we're looking at a globalized world, NGOs, institutions are looking at for people who have a knowledge, not just of the UK legal system, but of how that legal system interacts with other systems. So, so as is ideally placed to give you that knowledge. Um, of course, many of you may already want know that you want to do a, to practice law, you want to be a legal practitioner. Um, and if that's what you want to do, you can, uh, of course, uh, the LL, you can uh, practice law immediately. Or if you're doing the MA version, you may still need to do a law conversion course. And it's really important to remind you that this MA in law is not a qualifying law degree. So it does not allow you to practice law. If you're interested in um, practicing law after an MA in law, you will need to do um, a conversion course. You may also want to think about our LLB, senior status LLB program. Our senior status LLB program is a two-year program, which is a qualifying law degree for those who have a previous degree that is not in law. So that's a two-year program. It's um, a, a usual LLB is a three-year program. The senior status compresses that into two years. It's an intensive program. Uh, it, uh, and I do mean intensive, you do take more modules than what you would do in an LLB, but it is uh, crucially a qualifying law degree. So for those of you who don't yet have um, a law degree and you want to practice law, you might also want to think about the senior status LLB. Um, a lot of our uh, our students also end up taking, uh, as Aditunji asked, the route to academia. So uh, they start thinking about their MRES or potentially, if you've done an LLM, you're potentially already ready for the PhD. And it's, and we a lot of our PhD students have had previous SOAS LLMs. And of course, that's not necessary. You don't have to have a SOAS LLM to enter the SOAS PhD program. Martin? Yeah, no, excellent, Kanika. There's really not much to, to add. I think, yes, I'd also like to stress that our students really tend to, to go into kind of careers which have a kind of strong international, transnational element. So work for UN organizations, for, for let's call them global NGOs or civil society uh, 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 organizations. A few of our students also in the end kind of uh, end up working for, for government departments in, in, in their home countries. And I must say now that I've been teaching law for almost 30 years, uh, I just uh, find kind of my students almost anywhere in the world. So if I go to a conference in Dubai or in Singapore, there's a very strong likelihood that uh, uh, I will also so meet one of my students and in fact all of us kind of make an effort so so I was at the conference in Dubai last week and met my PhD student in Abu Dhabi in the evening for a supervision session and this is kind of uh, yes very much a kind of source source event which kind of seems quite normal from from most of uh, from all of us uh, as staff and supervisors but is perhaps in the context of other institutions still a bit unusual now what we haven't done in our session is give you much information about kind of practical matters and for this really we have other parts of of source and uh, which will give you uh, information on on scholarships on accommodations on on fees and so on so so kanaka and my 
contribution here is very much on the academic program, but the number of ways of getting more information on the kind of practical matters. And let me just see questions. Yes, questions. So, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the slideshow now so that we, we have another kind of five or six minutes in our session. So I'll stop the slideshow now. And now I can see the full screen. I see Aditonji, hi. Uh, <laughs> now I can see a few people. So, so, so do you have any, any questions for Kanika? Uh, and and myself or indeed for, for Kim who works for uh, the the recruitment section of uh, of source please go ahead we've got a question in chat from uh, Lauren from New Zealand um, and Lauren asked just wondering how long the conversion course is my background is in anthropology sociology and policy uh, the conversion course is usually a one-year conversion course uh, but just to i can i can say a bit more about this because i did <laughs> one <laughs> so uh, hi lauren uh, from new zealand uh, this is also a long way i think you're slightly almost beaten by our james from hawaii who is also in in the chat but i'm not sure from london speaking what is further away perhaps new zealand actually but yes uh, so so actually the entry into the legal profession in England is changing now. So if you wanted to become a barrister and you don't have a law degree, you will still have to do the conversion course. I think uh, it's not called, uh, I think it's it's called now the graduate diploma in law and basically just consists of these seven uh, foundations of, of legal knowledge subjects and there are various kind of providers in in the London area which actually offer this conversion course I myself did it uh, in the early 90s and I must say it was was very hard work but in some ways also an efficient way to actually get a qualifying law degree if you wanted to become a solicitor you don't need to take a qualifying law degree any longer this has been replaced by the solicitors qualifying exam SQE and you can sit these SQEs without having studied law albeit that your chances of passing these SQEs without having studied law are quite low so 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 in some ways also the formal requirement has been relaxed the substantive element of knowing quite a lot of law in order to pass to pass it hasn't really hasn't really changed. So it's still well worth if you wanted to become a solicitor to do, for instance, the, as Kanika said, the senior status LLB or, or the conversion course. And to my knowledge for the conversion course, you actually need a, a UK undergraduate degree. It has to be a UK, UK degree in order to do this, or for that matter, a, a UK postgraduate degree. I'm going to mute myself. Just to add to what Martin said, we at so as we don't actually offer the conversion course. So the conversion course is something that is external to us. Uh, and as Martin said, the conversion course very strongly focuses on the seven core uh, sort of UK law modules. You've got property, tort, uh, public law, criminal law, etc. And often um, they might not actually give you sort of that SOAS flavor because you'll be just doing um, UK law. So I do think that the if if you know already that you want to practice law, the SSLLB, the senior status LLB might be better because it allows you to do those modules, but it also gives you that that SOAS flavor of being able to dip into modules of Asia from Asia and Africa and all those non-UK focus, if that's what you're interested in. So you've got lots of options there. Um, I hope that answers your question, Lauren. We've got a next question from, um, sorry, I'm not sure, Lauren, what you mean? The, you thought the course was outside SOAS. The conversion course is outside external to SOAS. The senior status uh, qualifying law degree is something that SOAS offers. It does, however, uh, give you an LLB degree and not an LLM or a master's degree, depending on what you're interested mm. in. 
Uh, Nina from Japan asks, are internships or work experience for LLM students common? If common, in what kind of sectors? Uh, I would say, yes, they are very common. Most of our students are actually doing something alongside their um, studies. I think uh, increasingly students are aware that when they're going to employers at the end of their degree, the employer is looking for a holistic package. So they're looking for extracurricular activities, whether those are extracurricular activities within SOAS and membership of law societies, etc., or whether it's activities outside SOAS where you work or intern um, or any of that. Uh, what sort of in sectors do they work on? I would say it's very broad. It depends entirely on what you're interested in. So uh, again, think tanks, advocacy and policy units, but also journalism and media, uh, NGOs that work with women's rights, human rights, all of those uh, are fairly common um, sectors for our students to be working in. Uh, I can just, uh, we don't really have a huge amount more, more time, so if you have any follow-up questions, you're always welcome to, to email us. I'll just very quickly go through the other question. Participation, Labiba asked, uh, yes, we definitely, as I mentioned, you know, you can participate in research center activities, and in fact, there's even a journal specifically to the uh, uh, postgraduate students so, so that is definitely an option uh, international student uh, research um, opportunities Martin, before that do you want to touch on Mehik's question on selection criteria for the LLM ah yes because actually I'm currently also standing in as admissions tutor so uh, so basically you need to have decent grades in your undergraduate degree and if English is not your first language you also need to uh, to produce a kind of English language uh, certificate. And uh, we like you to also write uh, uh, something, a personal statement, which we look at. And uh, uh, yes, uh, all of this ticked and, and uh, looked at by our admissions team and myself, you will get admission to the LLM. Thank uh, you. So we've got um we've got a couple of questions on research center participation and i think you've already talked about it i think i, I also want to highlight one thing that we're doing from this year which is that you know we've for because of COVID, we've moved from an online only to a hybrid system this year, and we're slowly making our way to fully in-person again. And one of the things that uh, we lost last year to a degree was just being able to interact with each other. So what we're doing this year is weekly seminars at the School of Law, Gender and Media, uh, two weekly seminars actually, uh, where we invite uh, people from all over the world to come and talk to us about their research and all of these uh, research seminars which are usually hosted by um, our centers are open to all our students so all our undergrad and uh, master students have uh, the opportunity to uh, to end, to sit in these seminars and to learn not just from us but from all these um, people that we invite to come and have a talk at SOAS. Um, Evangeline asks uh, that I was just wondering what hands-on experience opportunities were available to students during studies. I'm looking to study international law and want to know if there are research opportunities available. Um, Evangeline, do you mean research opportunities within SOAS itself or I'll, I'll, if you could type what you mean by that, we could potentially come back. Uh, Nikhil from India asks, uh, same question as Labiba. I've, I'm very interested in the work that the Center for the Study of Colonialism, Empire and International Law is doing. I was wondering if general LLM students are allowed to be a part of it. Uh, by a part of it, uh, yes, in the sense that you can attend any of the seminars or conferences that they host. Um, membership of the Center is, um, it depends from center to center, so I'm not actually sure what Cecil's uh, membership criteria is, but I think it might be not open to PGT membership, but will be open to larger PGT participation in their events. 
Annika, um, I'm really sorry. I, I need to leave, actually. As I said, I have a meeting with kind of uh, various participants. So, so unfortunately, I can't on my own shift the meeting. So, so I need to say goodbye to all of you. I've sent a text. You hope to see you in 2022. Uh, Kanika, I think you also need to leave, don't you? Yes, I really, really do. So, because okay. Kanika's teaching. Yeah. So, so Kanika, <laughs> please. If both of you um, do need to leave, that's fine. Um, I will just put my um, email address in the chat box. So if you have any questions that we haven't answered here today and you would like to forward them through to me, you can do in that I will send them out to the various members of the team if that's easier for everybody. And then just because I know a few people had asked about research, we actually did a webinar um, about being interested in doing a PhD at SOAS in general. Um, not just for the law school, but across everything. And it tells you about how you make that application. It tells you about kind of top tips for that. So please do go on and watch that. It's quite helpful. It just tells you about um, research in general at SOAS as well. So if you want to um, email me with any other questions, do feel free and I will make sure that they get sent around to everybody. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Bye bye everyone. Good luck. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Kanika. Take care. Bye bye.